Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is Hodgkin lymphoma. There is another video on introduction to lymphoid neoplasms that I recommend that you start with first. In this video, I'll be reviewing the pathophysiology and morphologic features of the Hodgkin lymphomas. So this is a uh, slide from that earlier video that I referenced uh, looking at the types of hematopoietic neoplasms. So as you're aware, we can have our lymphoid, our myeloid, and our histiocytoid. Uh, in this video, we'll be focusing on our Hodgkin lymphomas, which are neoplasms of Reed Sternberg cells and their variants. So this is also an image that I showed in that earlier video, just to help uh, solidify for you uh, the differences between the Hodgkin lymphomas and the non-Hodgkin lymphomas. So our Hodgkin lymphomas are quite unusual. Uh, they're most often localized to a single axial group of nodes, so for example, a cervical lymph node or a mediastinal lymph node group, uh, and they tend to have a very orderly spread from uh, one set of lymph nodes to a contiguous set of lymph nodes. This is in contrast to the uh, somewhat random and non-contiguous spread we can see in non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, it uh, rarely involves mesenteric nodes or the wall dye or ring, again, in contrast to non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and we only very rarely will see extranodal involvement. So Hodgkin lymphomas are neoplasms of germinal center B cells, and the uh, cell in particular that we're focused on is our Reed Sternberg cell. Uh, now it says here it's only a minor component of the tumor, and I'll show you uh, some images uh, where you can see how this fits into the general uh, tumor microenvironment. The Reed Sternberg cell is going to be a fairly large cell, uh, which can either have a multiple uh, nuclei or single multi-lobed nucleus or just one uh, single uh, nucleus. Uh, both of these will have these uh, inclusion-like nucleoli, which you can see here. Uh, this one, which is a classic Reed Sternberg cell, uh, has that appearance uh, like a mirror image. This is sometimes referred to as looking like owl eyes. Uh, the immunophenotype of these cells is also quite unusual. They are positive for CD15 and CD30, uh, and negative uh, for CD45, our leukocyte common antigen, which you might expect in uh, one of our B cells. Now, uh, I mentioned that this is only a small component of the tumor. What is it that's making up the rest of that mass? It's going to be a robust mixed inflammatory infiltrate. And in fact, even in this tightly cropped image, you can see an eosinophil who is approaching uh, this Reed Sternberg cell. And I'll explain to you in a bit what is drawing this eosinophil here and what it is doing for the Reed Sternberg cell. Hodgkin lymphoma is frequently associated with Epstein-Barr virus, uh, and we'll talk about the differences among the, the different uh, types of Hodgkin lymphoma. There are five subtypes of Hodgkin lymphoma. Let's look at those next. So this is a table from robinson cotron uh, Pathologic Basis of Disease, that I think is a really nice overview of the five types of Hodgkin lymphoma. Now we divide these up as a classic Hodgkin lymphoma, which is going to be our nodular sclerosis, mixed cellularity, and our lymphocyte-rich and lymphocyte-depleted uh, variants. These will account for 90 to 95% of Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, with most of them being nodular sclerosis, uh, and then second, uh, followed by mixed cellularity. Uh, the outlier here is going to be our nodular lymphocyte predominant uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, in which uh, our uh, neoplastic cells are referred to as LNH or popcorn cells. And in contrast to Reed Sternberg cells, they will be negative for CD15 and CD30, uh, but they will be positive uh, for CD20, which is a B cell uh, marker. Uh, this goes uh, over the clinical features. I'll be touching on those uh, in this video. So let's begin by looking at nodular sclerosis uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, which is the most common variant, uh, accounting for about 60 to 75 percent of cases. Uh, there is an equal uh, sex uh, prevalence. Uh, the lymph nodes that uh, tend to be involved are the lower cervical, uh, supraclavicular, and mediastinal lymph nodes. So you might have a patient who presents with a, a non-tender mass here in the supraclavicular region. Uh, patients are typically adolescents or young adults, and because the disease prints, uh, presents at early stage, so stage one or two, uh, it tends to have an excellent prognosis. Now, although I described the importance of the Reed Sternberg cell, what we'll be looking for in nodular sclerosis Hodgkin, uh, Hodgkin lymphoma will be what is referred to as a lacunar cell. We can still see some occasional Reed Sternberg cells, but lacunar cells will be easier to find. 
and they are characterized by a folded uh, multilobate nucleus uh, with abundant uh, pale cytoplasm. And for whatever reason, the cytoplasm tends to tear and be disrupted uh, during sectioning, and that causes the appearance of like a hole has been punched out around uh, this nucleus, and that is where the term comes from. Lacoon refers to a hole. Uh, you may recall this from lacunar infarcts uh, that we talked about in hypertension uh, and infarcts in the brain. Now, we will see occasional Reed Sternberg cells, and we will have a mixed inflammatory infiltrate with eosinophils and neutrophils, plasma cells, and macrophages. But the uh, other characteristic feature will be these dense collagen bands. This is why we call it nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma. And I'll discuss uh, some of the mediators that cause this fibrosis uh, towards the end of this video. Nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma tends to be negative for Epstein Barr virus. Here on a low power view of a lymph node with nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma, you can see that uh, why we call this nodular sclerosis. Here we have these nodules uh, of uh, mixed inflammation uh, separated by these dense bands of collagen. Uh, so these uh, collagen bands. Uh, this is an example of a lacunar cell. Uh, where you can see this very convoluted uh, nucleus, and uh, it seems to have pulled away. We have this gap, uh, this hole in which it's sitting. That is uh, what we call a lacunar cell. Now, the next variant, which accounts for about 25% of cases, uh, is our mixed cellularity Hodgkin lymphoma. Now, this has a biphasic peak, adolescence and young adulthood, it then drops, and then we see it uh, occur again in patients over the age of 55. And in fact, mixed cellularity Hodgkin lymphoma is the most common variant in patients over 50 years. Uh, males are affected more commonly than females, and unlike nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma, which is typically uh, presenting at stage 1 or 2, we can see this at stage 3 or 4, uh, and it may be uh, disseminated, presenting with systemic symptoms. These are referred to as B symptoms uh, and include weight loss, uh, fever, and night sweats. However, despite uh, this uh, advanced uh, uh, presentation, overall prognosis is very good. Now, this is uh, the variant I look to when I want to find a Reed Sternberg cell because we will have abundant uh, RS cells as well as our mononuclear variants. This one as well will have this mixed inflammatory infiltrate, and about 70% of these cases are positive for Epstein Barr virus. So, since this is where I tend to look for uh, Reed Sternberg cells, let's look at some more of those. So this is uh, showing a Reed Sternberg cell that I showed you earlier with its uh, eosinophil right next to it. Uh, and you can see here's uh, another uh, uh, slide which shows uh, these Reed Sternberg cells. Here's one here. Here's another classic morphology with that owl eye appearance. There are some mononuclear variants here as well. But what you can appreciate is this really prominent uh, inclusion-like um, nucleolus uh, that we see here. And uh, you can also appreciate there's this mixed inflammation in the background. Uh, so here we have primarily lymphocytes. We'll talk about uh, this mixed inflammation in a bit. But let's finish up by taking a look at these Reed Sternberg cells. Now think for a moment, what's our immunophenotype? Let's take a look. We're going to be positive for CD30. Here you can see uh, there are abundant uh, of these Reed Sternberg cells and the variants uh, in this particular slide. Here you can see that classic one with that owl eye appearance, uh, that mirror uh, image. Uh, and then here again, you can see a CD15 immunohistochemical stain uh, showing again that inclusion like nucleolus uh, in this uh, owl eye uh, cell. Now, there are two uh, other uh, variants of classic Hodgkin lymphoma that are quite uncommon. Uh, they're referred to as lymphocyte-rich and lymphocyte-depleted. Uh, this is because they're quite similar, depending uh, the difference is really whether we have abundant T lymphocytes or not. So in the lymphocyte-rich, again, we're going to see our uh, Reed Sternberg cells and mononuclear variants. We're going to have sheets of abundant uh, T lymphocytes, and about 40% of these are associated with Epstein-Barr virus. In our lymphocyte depleted, which is less than 5% of cases uh, of Hodgkin lymphoma, we will again see our frequent RS cells and mononuclear variants. Uh, in a sparse inflammatory infiltrate, uh, more than 90% of these will be uh, positive for Epstein-Barr virus. So this brings us to our last uh, type of Hodgkin lymphoma. This one is not classic. Uh, and the way that we recognize it as not being classic is that it does not have our um, uh, CD15 positive, CD30 positive uh, uh, neoplastic cells. Now, we can have a few Reed Sternberg cells present, but the real cells we're going to be focusing on here will be our lymphocytic and histiocytic cells, referred to as LNH cells. Also, popcorn cells, because they have these very convoluted uh, nuclei. 
Uh, the nodular aspect is not the nodules that we see in nodular sclerosis Hodgkin lymphoma, where the nodules uh, are formed by collagen. Instead, we get uh, nodules uh, of these uh, uh, popcorn cells uh, in uh, the uh, lymph node surrounded by uh, small B cells and macrophages. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is uh, also a, a rare uh, disease. It has a male predominance. Uh, most patients are under the age of 35. Uh, patients will again typically present with low stage disease, so isolated cervical uh, or axillary lymph adenopathy, and again, low stage is going to be associated with an excellent prognosis. About 3 to 5 percent can transform to a high grade lymphoma, such as a uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So, we've already talked a little bit about our morphology. Uh, we're going to uh, see that these uh, LNH cells are going to be negative for CD15 uh, and 30, uh, but positive for CD20. We'll also have uh, just very rare eosinophils and plasma cells. So most of the uh, background here is going to be uh, our lymphocytes, uh, and these are typically Epstein-Barr virus negative. So here's just a very nice example of one of these. This is a popcorn cell, where you can see it actually looks quite similar to a piece of popcorn. We have the convoluted uh, nucleus here, which is the exploded kernel, and you can see the uh, white aspect here, which is the popped corn. Uh, and then just to confirm for you that these cells, these very large cells, are positive for CD20, there are some scattered uh, small B cells around as well. So how does uh, classic Hodgkin lymphoma uh, arise? Uh, so we have these uh, rare uh, neoplastic cells, but all these other uh, supportive cells. Now, uh, for classic Hodgkin lymphoma, the uh, central uh, focus will be activation of the transcription factor NF-kappa-B, which will uh, then cause uh, the um, production of uh, proteins from genes that promote uh, growth and survival of our reed sternberg cells. So how do we activate uh, NF-kappa-B? Well, for uh, one possibility, if we have Epstein-Barr virus positive tumor cells, EBV uh, can produce a protein called latent membrane protein 1, or LMP1, that will upregulate NF-kappa-B. We can also get loss of function mutations in negative regulators of NF-kappa-B. And uh, as we look at the uh, tumor microenvironment and all the uh, mixed inflammatory cells that are called to the area by the reed sternberg cells, we can see that some of these cells, such as eosinophils and T-cells, will bind to receptors uh, on the reed sternberg cell, thereby again uh, increasing activity of NF-kappa-B. Some of the uh, other tricks that Reed Sternberg cells employ uh, will be they can have copy number gains in genes for PDL1 and PDL2. Uh, these are our checkpoint proteins that are going to decrease our anti tumor T cell response. So these uh, rare Reed Sternberg cells are doing everything they can uh, to uh, remain hidden. And they'll be secreting cytokines and chemokines to create the tumor microenvironment that they need to survive. So here's uh, just another image showing a beautiful Reed Sternberg cell and a mononuclear variant. But again, I wanted to point out here we have some eosinophils as well as some uh, mixed lymphocytes. Now here's another image uh, where we don't have Reed Sternberg cells. They are in a different uh, part of this particular tumor. But I wanted to share this with you so you could appreciate again the eosinophils here and here. And then look at all of these neutrophils that are percolating through here. And you can see why if you were to see this image, you might be thinking more about an infectious uh, reaction. Uh, we have neutrophils. Are there bacteria here? We've got eosinophils. Could it be some sort uh, of parasite? Uh, there'll be plasma cells and macrophages. Uh, you have to really be aware of the possibility of a neoplasm, or you'll be thinking this is all uh, just uh, an inflammatory response. So this uh, inflammatory response is actually created by our neoplastic cells. It is going to uh, uh, release uh, chemokines and cytokines to recruit uh, the eosinophils, neutrophils, plasma cells, macrophages, uh, Th2, Treg, B cells, and fibroblasts, so they will support, nourish, and protect our RS cells. But they will uh, be, if you look at this mixed inflammation, you'll notice that uh, Th1, CD8 positive, and, and natural killer cells are uh, going to be very uh, common. These are ones that would be attacking our tumor cells. So we're going to be uh, emphasizing ones that will protect us and trying to prevent these uh, from coming into the tumor microenvironment. So the way that they do this is they secrete a lot of different mediators. So they can use IL-5 and eotaxin to recruit eosinophils. What do eosinophils do for the reed sternberg cells? As I mentioned before, they can have uh, ligands that are going to uh, bind receptors on the reed sternberg cell, increasing uh, our NF-kappa-B. 
Uh, IL-10 uh, is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, so it's going to decrease the host immune response and decrease the Th1 response. IL-13 uh, has an autocrine growth effect, so it is uh, produced by the tumor cell. It will then bind to a receptor on the tumor cell, stimulating growth. Our fibrosis is going to come from our transforming growth factor beta, as well as our basic fibroblast uh, growth factor. Uh, TGF beta is also going to incre increase our fibroblast uh, growth. Uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha is going to uh, push fibroblasts to secrete eotaxin. What's eotaxin going to do? Eosinophil recruitment, then back to stimulating NF-kappa B. Uh, we'll be uh, stimulating and activating our monocytes and macrophages through uh, monocyte uh, colony stimulating factor. And then galactins are proteins that are going to increase the Treg response. Again, this is immunosuppressant, as well as stimulating our Th2 uh, cells to, uh, uh, to support plasma cells. And then uh, just a final uh, issue about the microenvironment, we're going to have Epstein-Barr virus in a subset of our Hodgkin lymphoma that will con uh, contribute to this chronic inflammatory environment. So this is a figure that I've modified from a Robbins and Cotron uh, pathologic basis of disease that just shows you uh, this uh, Reed-Sternberg cell and how it is secreting these uh, varieties of uh, cytokines and chemokines to create the tumor microenvironment that it needs. Uh, I also uh, have referred to the immune evasion uh, of uh, the Reed-Sternberg cells. They work very hard at this. So they can uh, lose their beta-2 microglobulin function as well as uh, expression of MHC class 1 molecules. This is going to uh, decrease uh, and inhibit our CD8 positive T cell activation, so they will not be killing our Reed-Sternberg cells. We're going to attract our immunosuppressant T reg and produce IL-10, uh, which in addition to the uh, factors, uh, the uh, functions I I mentioned before, will decrease the function of the cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells. And again, we're going to uh, express high levels of our PD-1 ligands uh, to, uh, to reduce uh, the T cell response. So uh, we can look here at Hodgkin lymphoma staging when we're trying to uh, understand uh, how this patient's prognosis is and how we should treat that patient. I don't think uh, you need to memorize this, but I just wanted to share this with you so you can see this orderly progression as uh, we look at staging in Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, this is actually uh, just a general lymphoma staging. We don't tend to use this for non-Hodgkin lymphomas. Uh, we will uh, further uh, categorize these whether they uh, have or lack uh, the B symptoms, so significant fever, night sweats, or uh, weight loss. So the way that these patients will typically present will be with a painless lymph adenopathy. Uh, with more uh, advanced or disseminated disease, we could see the constitutional symptoms, referred to as B symptoms, uh, fever, night sweats, and weight loss. Now, in patients with low-stage disease, the cure rate is close to 90%, but how do we treat them? We used to use radiotherapy because remember that uh, in low-stage disease, we're going to have uh, just a single area or uh, two contiguous areas that have uh, this uh, involvement by tumor. So radiotherapy uh, could be used, and while this can be curative, it increases the risk of subsequent cancers such as breast and lung carcinomas. Uh, alkylating agents are also very effective, but they increase the risk of secondary tumors such as acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, and so we're new, using new treatment regimens uh, and have uh, been using checkpoint inhibitors, which have uh, less of a, a burden uh, on patients. Now, patients with disseminated disease, so stage 3 or 4, can still have a pretty good survival, uh, 60 to 70 percent. They as well more commonly present with those B symptoms as well as anemia and pruritus. Uh, as always, I'd like to finish up with a few questions. Uh, please take a look at these and review what you have learned. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, please do subscribe. Uh, I really do appreciate your support. Thank you very much.